Thanks, Kiera. Hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. As Kiera said, the uh, uh, webinar today uh, will be uh, the, the second one in the series for uh, ACDI Lab. And uh, today we're going to talk uh, more about uh, the uh, name uh, and uh, FISCHEM and Admitox prediction features of uh, ACDI Lab. So, uh, how do we uh, access iLab? As uh, Kiera said, you have to go to cds.rsc.org and uh, you need to uh, click on the top left the ACD iLab uh, uh, picture and this will bring you into uh, ACD iLab. If you are logging in from an academic institution in the UK, you will be directed uh, straight into iLab. If not, uh, you will get uh, a login screen like this, and uh, here you will need to enter your credentials if you have them. Um, now, um, what does ACD uh, iLab offer? Uh, ACD iLab offers NMR database and prediction. It offers physical predictions, admin toxicity predictions, naming of compounds according to UPAC. Uh, ACD iLab will work on Windows, will work on Mac OS X and Linux and it's compatible with most popular browsers, Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, and Chrome. I have a little asterisk there on Chrome, and that's because uh, uh, some of the functionality in iLab uh, includes using uh, some little JavaScripts, Java applets, and Chrome by default is blocking them. Actually, it's totally blocking them, so this cannot be used. And the functionality, this functionality uh, affects mostly the ability to paste a structure, okay? Uh, during this demonstration, I will be using Firefox, and uh, today we will focus on the physical predictions, on the admin toxicity predictions, and naming of compounds. Okay, without uh, further delays, let's move into uh, the actual software. <coughs> so, I am here now uh, at the uh, CBS uh, uh, website, and I'm going to click the iLab and uh, I see it is connecting and uh, it directs me straight through, straight into uh, the iLab and uh, I see here a few options that are uh, opened and expanded and uh, I have here a window to, uh, for the structure and uh, sometimes you will see some useful information here. So, uh, the first question is, uh, yeah, how are we going to input a structure? And there are a few options. You can either draw it, or if you draw it, you can look at it in the dictionary. You can upload it from a file on your computer. You can paste it from the clipboard, or you can enter it in Smiles notation. Let's try to draw a structure. So the moment I click the little pencil here, I get the structure editor, and I have on top the tools, and on the side, the atoms and the uh, groups I can use. So let's start by putting a nice aromatic ring here. And uh, we can put, uh, if I want to put now a carbon uh, bond to this one, I go on the ring, I see the CH being surrounded by a square. And the moment I click and drag, I see a bond being created. I leave it and I have added a methyl on my aromatic ring. Um, I can, uh, if I want to make uh, uh, an oxygen or another atom, I can go here and click and drag and this becomes an oxygen. If I want to convert uh, a bond to a double bond, I go on the bond and click on it. Okay, and if I go here and click again, I made a very nice acid. And uh, I, can, uh, I can continue drawing things and uh, I'm just trying to make something that makes a little bit of chemical sense. Now, you see what happened here is that I hurried a little bit and I didn't quite click on the atom, so I just added uh, another uh, uh, ethane molecule there. If you did a mistake, you can click the undo button and the undo button again. So, let me be a little bit more careful. There you go. And I can add maybe another oxygen here, and make this bond also double, and we have a nice aspirin molecule. Now, if you, um, if you want to make it a little bit uh, looking better, because you see some of the bond angles are not quite correct or whatever, 
you can click this uh, uh, clean structure icon and uh, this will make the structure look uh, a little bit neater. If you don't like this appearance, you can click it again and it's going to switch to a different arrangement that may look better. And uh, you can click it a third time and it's going to go back to the first one. Uh, there are a few more tools here. So you have the um, delete button and uh, if you want, uh, if you can delete one whole uh, one whole atom. So I can go here and delete this methyl. Uh, I'm going to put it back now. And there is also this uh, Broomba icon and this will clear all the structure. If you are uh, making uh, a repetitive chain, you can uh, uh, click the chain icon and then select a carbon and what happens now is that when you click and hold it and move the mouse, uh, more chains will be added. And uh, actually I need to be here. So uh, if you don't like these things, you can remove them. Okay, and also you see here we have a node in the middle. If you don't like this node, you can remove it. Now you have a straight one or undo everything. But for the purposes of this webinar, I think we should probably stop somewhere here. Let's delete these ones also. And once you are done drawing your structure, you can submit it. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing you see is some uh, starting physical properties. Okay. Uh, you can expand and minimize the available modules and uh, just to make things a little bit neater. So, so since this uh, webinar is uh, addressed mostly to chemists, let's start with uh, the naming part. So the naming part uh, includes uh, uh, four options and the first two ones are called uh, IUPAC name and IUPAC name free. Let's start with a free one. If you click free, you get uh, the IUPAC name and nothing else. If you click the IUPAC name, which is not free, but for you people uh, it's going to be free anyhow, uh, you get some options. Okay? So by default, the name generated is the, IUP is the IUPAC name that uh, complies with the uh, IUPAC rules set in 2013. Okay, ACD Labs is uh, uh, very deeply involved into the uh, UPAC naming committees and uh, Andre Yerin, our head of uh, development for, um, uh, for uh, drawing a program is, uh, uh, is heading this uh, committee of uh, UPAC. So uh, we are following uh, the rules, uh, you know, uh, as they are set. If now for some reasons you want to name it uh, your company, by not complying with these rules, you just unselect this option and now you can, you can change things. So for, for example, let's change this here. So instead of uh, uh, using the retained replacement to use the, um, use the standard name, so instead of methyl benzene, let's use, let's say, toluene. In our case, uh, I select this. In our case, let's see what the difference will be. I click get a UPAC name. And now uh, this becomes acetoxy, acetoxy benzoic acid. Okay, and uh, a few other things that you can play around with here. Yeah. Um, there is also the option to uh, generate the index name. And the index name is the name used for, um, uh, from the um, chemical abstract services of the American Chemical Society. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, uh, rules also that this is generated and uh, by default the ones, uh, the ones used are the ones that are the most uh, widely acceptable. So if I click, uh, if you see the index name, it appeared here and if you change something, uh, you will get maybe a different name here. Okay, well not in this case. All right. Now the um, uh, ACDI lab offers you the option of doing the reverse thing. So if you have a name, you can generate the structure. And uh, let's do this. So uh, uh, you can enter a name here. You see it includes uh, 
it has what I was using a moment ago, uh, ibuprofen. And if I try to get the structure for ibuprofen, it's going to tell me that no, it cannot recognize the name because it's not an IUPA compliant name. Uh, in that case, you have the option to search the ACD dictionary, which uh, I think has around uh, uh, half a million compounds. If I select to search the ACD dictionary and get the structure, now I get uh, the structure of ibuprofen because this is, uh, this is a common structure uh, that exists in the, in the dictionary. Okay, uh, once you have the structure, you can click here to copy the structure to the clipboard and paste it for some of the other predictions you may want to do. Okay, now um, name to structure will work quite reliably with, uh, uh, with all sorts of names. And just to show you the strength of it, uh, I have here a very big name. Let me just copy it. Um, so uh, if you have uh, a name like that, okay, which uh, goes quite a bit, I can click Get the Structure. And it's going to give me the structure. Okay. So uh, as long as the name is compliant with the rules, uh, you will get uh, a structure. Uh, let's copy this structure. This looks an interesting one to deal with. And uh, yeah, let's go back to um, let's go back to the physchem options. And uh, let's try to calculate uh, physchem options. So now I'm going to. Uh, paste the structure, paste the molecule from the clipboard. Again, please remember that uh, this functionality will, wo will not work with Chrome. Uh, and uh, also with uh, most of the other browsers, you will get uh, lots of warnings about allowing Java and whatever. Just accept everything and it should be fine. Okay, so we see here some basic uh, um, uh, physical properties have been calculated. Uh, for this compound, and then you can go on and calculate uh, more things. So some properties that are of interest are the log p. And uh, we see now uh, the log p is calculated to uh, a value of minus 0 0.29 plus minus 1.01, .01, which is quite a big deviation. But we also see up here that it's not reliable. It's marked as not reliable. And uh, the reason uh, the, for this, this is that the way this calculation is done is uh, done by using um, what is called uh, fragment-based prediction. And it's looking at the library to see what similar fragments uh, uh, exist and what is the uh, log p value and calculates the value from there. Okay, now this particular molecule is a little peptide. So that's probably the reason why um, it is not uh, 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 why it is not predicted well, but uh, we can take this opportunity and open a new file, upload the file with a new structure. So uh, let's select uh, a compound like Lipitor, which uh, is a compound to, uh, as a small molecule or known. Uh, so we should get some more uh, meaningful results. So here we have uh, uh, the Lipitor. You see it is selected. Then we click Send File. <coughs> and we say it says Success. File is valid. was successfully uploaded. We click OK. And after a little bit, we get our file here. And uh, we see now that uh, the uh, log P is calculated to be 4.13 with an accuracy of plus minus 1.4. But right now, the reliability is moderate uh, because uh, uh, the training set in the database has sufficient entries similar to this. OK. Now, another very useful property is log D. And uh, log, D, yeah, log P works for non-charged compounds. Usually, log D works for charged compounds. And here, we see uh, the log D values, the distribution coefficient, at different pH values. And uh, also below, we see a graph of log D. And um, 
the, uh, by default, the system comes with these uh, pH values, which are the most common pH values from a biological and pharmaceutical point of view. If, for whatever reason, you want uh, uh, a more accurate uh, number uh, at another pH, you just click here to add a value, and let's say you want, uh, I don't know, pH 9. We click Add, and we see 9 is added. Uh, uh, there as well. And uh, you have the chart here, and you can, as you move the uh, mouse over the chart, you see the log D value up here changing. Okay? Now, the uh, PKA calculations, we see there are two options for calculating the PKA. The one is marked as ACD PKA, and um, in this case, uh, we get these results, and then there is also another one marked simple PKA. Now, um, we see a little bit different information here. Uh, both algorithms come from ACD, of course, because we are using ACD iLab. The difference is that the one marked as ACD PKA is, let's say, the traditional algorithm that has been used by ACD since I don't know how many years. The other PKA is a different algorithm that came from a company that um, uh, ACD purchased a few years ago. Uh, so, uh, what you see here is, um, uh, yeah, the results are very similar usually. Uh, again, depending a lot on the training set and the libraries that exist. Uh, but here on uh, the uh, PKA one, you see also a chart of the um, net charges versus pH, or you can change it to see protonation state versus pH, uh, or uh, ionogenic uh, groups versus pH. Okay, the groups are marked color-coded on the structure, so you can see exactly which, uh, which uh, part of the structure contributes uh, to its uh, ionic change. Uh, now, in uh, all these cases, so whatever we have seen so far, there is the option here to download the report. And if you click this icon here, a PDF report will be generated and uh, uh, downloaded uh, for you to view. I'm not going to click it now because it may take a little bit of time if you have graphs and things like that, but uh, it works uh, quite nicely. Now, uh, going to the last part of this webinar, let's look at the uh, ADMI and uh, toxicity predictions. So there are quite a few properties here that can be uh, calculated. Let's uh, click this uh, BBB thing which uh, stands for blood-brain barrier uh, transport. So, um, uh, is using uh, uh, the values, the calculated values of log P and PKA uh, in order to uh, calculate how likely it is uh, uh, for this compound uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier. So, whether this compound will have an effect uh, uh, on brain cells. And we see that for this particular one, uh, it says that uh, probably it's inactive for the central nervous system uh, due to low brain penetration. And uh, down here, we see also a chart of the, actually, I need to scroll a little bit down. There you go. So we see a chart of uh, the compounds um, uh, according to whether they are uh, active in the central nervous system and their uh, log uh, P uh, uh, properties um, for the brain function. And you see the ones that are marked blue are uh, active, the ones that are marked uh, orange are not active. And if you can see very carefully, right exactly here, there is the compound that uh, we added. Okay, so if I move here, we see that's the current molecule. And if you go around, you can see all the others, uh, all the other similar ones that are used uh, um, for this prediction. And uh, you can see here some ones that are active, uh, the, that are known to be active, and uh, uh, you can probably tell the differences uh, between them and the compound that you are looking at. Okay, now, um, in the same sense, uh, I mean, you can talk, we can talk about uh, all, these all these properties, but, uh, you know, the 
webinar will take quite a bit of time. Uh, let's uh, check some of the toxicity uh, predictions. So this one uh, shows us the uh, whether the um, whether this compound uh, will inhibit the human ethera go go channel, and uh, we see here that the reliability is. Uh, uh, it says that the probability is 0 0.2, and the ability so probably uh, it, it will not uh, uh, it will not uh, inhibit this channel. But uh, here we see some experimental values for similar structures, and we see that this particular one is a non-inhibitor, and we also see some uh, literature references there. So, since we have uh, almost reached the 20-minute uh, mark, I think I will stop here with uh, these things, and uh, uh, I think we can open the session for questions, if there are any. Okay, you can enter your questions in the, um, in the question box on the side panel. Okay. So, uh, I already see a couple of questions. The first question is, what's the maximum size of the, um, of the molecule that can be used for these uh, calculations? So, um, in general, ACDI lab is something that's made for, uh, for small molecules, okay? Uh, now, um, you will get a name with fairly large molecules, but uh, in reality, you should be more um, uh, looking into something around not more than 100 or 200 heavy atoms. Okay, heavy atoms means carbons, oxygens, nitrogen, and things like that. Hydrogens doesn't count that much. Okay. Uh, the same thing is also true for the uh, for the predictions, and the reason is not you know that uh, the library or whatever is not uh, good enough. The reason is that uh, we are using this method of the fragment-based prediction, and uh, it turns out that as the molecules become bigger, then uh, some intramolecular effects start uh, being very significant, and the predictions are not accurate anymore. Uh, Dimitri, it looks like there's a few questions. Uh... If I can read out one from Caroline here, we've got a large number of solubility models. What is the difference between them? So uh, you are talking about the qualitative solubility. The uh, the differences are on the way that the uh, the way that the models um, are uh, uh, the way the solubility is calculated, and its principle it all comes from the two different uh, algorithms that are used. So the traditional uh, ACD one or the uh, um, or the one from uh, that company that ACD purchased a few years ago. Uh, in reality, the uh, reliability of them uh, depends on the um, on how many similar structures there are in the uh, in the training uh, uh, database. So uh, you should uh, you know check them and see um, which uh, performs better. And usually, you should also be looking at this reliability ability thing that appears in most calculations. Okay, there's one from Mark here, which is also about reliability. Uh, could you say something about how the models have been generated, for example, training sets and test sets, and how, yes. the, reli and how the reliability score is estimated? Okay, so the, um, the um, uh, models are generated from uh, uh, databases that we have and we are maintaining. And these are databases with values for compounds that have been given to us with uh, a few companies that uh, we are collaborating with. Now, um, what was the second part? Um, the second part was how the reliability score is estimated. Yeah, the reliability score is estimated based on the uh, similarity of uh, the given uh, structure to the ones that are in the library. Okay, so we are using the so-called uh, um, uh, Euclidean uh, uh, Euclidean distance uh, calculation of the structure similarity, and we get uh, uh, a similarity score. And if the uh, if this is uh, sufficiently high, then we say uh, 
would have good confidence that uh, what we have in the library will be a good match for what we are trying to predict. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next question we've got is, can you do batch processing yes. by uploading a file of compounds? Uh, so uh, batch processing is uh, um, is not possible with uh, with iLab, but you can do batch processing with the uh, desktop uh, um, software that uh, we are offering. So I see a related question. Can you calculate more than one molecule? Uh, no, you cannot calculate more than one molecule uh, in the same sense. So you cannot you cannot enter two molecules here and calculate properties for both. It will only calculate for one of the two, usually the biggest. If you have uh, uh, two compounds or a list of compounds in the form of an Excel spreadsheet or an SDF file or whatever, then you have to use our desktop software. Okay, I see the next. Can you export the calculated physical properties into Excel? Um, uh, not with this uh, software, not with iLab. Uh, you can download the report, uh, but uh, if you want, uh, uh, so let's go back here to the physical properties. You can download the report, but uh, nothing more. For more such advanced things, um, you have to use, again, uh, uh, the uh, desktop uh, software. So can it predict hydrogen bonding interactions within the molecule? That's a nice question. So uh, it should be able to predict it if uh, there are s similar structures in the training data set. Okay. Uh, usually, um, usually there should be, uh, because it works for things like small peptides or whatever. So uh, again, you should be looking at the uh, at the reliability that uh, is uh, uh, present, the reliability estimation. Okay. It looks like okay, this. I see another question. There is one more. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. The whether it's a question or not, it says there are common functional groups. I expect they should be in the database. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean here. Um, one thing that I should point out to you is that if you are trying to uh, upload a file, okay, so if you are trying to enter your structure by uploading a file, you should uh, not be using, you know, some abbreviations that are very uh, common and normal for you. So, for example, you should not enter something like a TS for tosylate. You know, uh, the iLab doesn't know these abbreviations. We are only following the um, abbreviations that are accepted by IUPAC. Okay, so you could find these uh, in the, um, uh, somewhere in the IUPAC website. But in reality, if you have some, uh, if you have a structure and you see that it's not accepted, uh, look at how the structure is drawn. So even things like, for example, CF3, which sounds like a common one, it's actually not an official UPAC abbreviation, and it should be entered explicitly as a carbon with three fluorines. Uh, in the same sense, also, your structure files should be clean in the sense uh, not, not having any texts or comments or annotations or something on the structure. It should just be the structure and nothing else. Okay, here's another question that appeared. Presumably, some of your collaborators don't want their structures revealed when you saw properties of similar structures. Can you say what proportion of your compounds you can't disclose? Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know the actual proportion, but uh, what I know is that for the structures that we are using in the database, we have gained the, the, uh, the values that we have from the people we are collaborating with, and they've given them to us, and they allowed us to show the structures. Okay, they are not, uh, no, nobody would give us, you know, for free, uh, sorry, nobody would give us uh, to distribute freely um, properties for molecules that uh, are still their intellectual property. So uh, the values that, uh, the, 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 the training databases that we use, uh, uh, consist of compounds that the people who contributed their properties with have no problem in revealing them. Okay, so that's not an issue. Now, if you want to have a, a different training database with compounds that you know you are working with and are not uh, commonly known yet, uh, then again you will have to get the uh, the Benchtop software, and uh, there you have the option of generating training data sets. Uh, training databases and libraries with your compounds 
that will not be distributed to anybody. So whatever whatever compound is used in the library can be disclosed. Okay. Did I miss any questions? Uh, no, it doesn't seem like there are any more questions. So if, if anyone else has anything else they'd like to add or ask, either send us through a question now, or of course you can always contact the Chemical Database Service at cds at rsc.org if you have any further questions about the resources. Uh, we are running a little bit over time now, so possibly in the interests of wrapping up the webinar, we might cut it off there. So thanks again, Dimitri, for all of your help. Thank you, Piera. And yeah, so again, you can access all of these through iLab on the NCDS website at cds.rsc.org. And please do get in touch if you have any questions. Thanks very much.